Class, we're going to just finish up the section on pop reply and reliability and then move over to the, the next section on transitions. So we ended off the class last time by looking at these series parallel structures. We said that many times when we have this need for increased reliability, we add units in parallel. So we saw examples of pumps in parallel and the necessary valves. So, so that was there. This one we've seen over and over uh, where we need good reliability on the control valve and so we can bypass around it so that if we need to maintain it, we can bypass it temporarily. And then finally we saw another example of a heat exchanger where if we need the reliability to shut that unit down for the hands of cleaning, we don't want to shut down the whole process, but then we add a whole variety of isolation valves around the units in order to keep that unit off the floor, in order to keep the rest of the floor shut off the floor. Everyone up to speed with this? Okay, so, so that's where we ended off, uh, off the class and actually there was one final example where I gave, gave this network over here and we asked what is the, the reliability of this overall network? So we've got three units in series, each with a reliability of 90%, we can compute the overall network's reliability. And then we considered the case, well, what if we take a parallel stream those same three units, but we just have another alternative path for the system to follow. What's the reliability of that? And then finally, we, we looked at this last case, which is an interesting example. Um, let's just put the numbers back up there so we have them. So we said, with this final example, all we do is we still buy six units, okay? Except we, we pipe it up differently. And this reliability then is dramatically increased. We go instead of from a 93% reliability, we can get a 97% reliability, just with some some clever piping. So these sorts of parallel structures are very very common on flow sheets. You've seen them on the PMIDs and the tutorials many times. But now you're starting to understand why they're why they're there, and also how we can quantify the reliability. Then I just wanted to end off this section with a final example, um, talking about boilers um, and utilities. So many processes have, have utility streams, so there's oxygen, steam requirements, and these utilities need to service a variety of what we call consumers on the process. So steam here goes to various consumers. These would be various heat exchangers, jackets on reactors, and so forth. Now, we could buy one large boiler to deliver all the steam we require, but you can start to see from a reliability perspective, this is putting all your eggs in one basket, right? So we don't want to do that. So what we'd rather do is we'd spend a little bit more capital and buy smaller boilers, which total the required capacity, but this allows us to have this enhanced reliability. Essentially what we've done is we've got these units now in parallel, and we can turn them on as needed to provide the steam demand. Okay, so this is, this is a very, very common feature we see. Like in my condo building, for example, I'm on the condo board and I was just getting a tour of the building the other day, and there we have three boilers for the building. In the summertime, one is running. In the wintertime, all three are running. And it allows us to maintain those boilers and alternate them to get that enhanced reliability. And the last thing we want is the lady in the penthouse coming to complain about the hot water, right? So, same thing on your chemical process. You don't want, at any point in time, not to be able to supply the steam demand required by the jacketed reactors and the heat exchangers. So, multiple small boilers. The other interesting reason why we do this is every one of those boilers has what we call an efficiency curve. So, efficiency on that axis over there and then on this horizontal axis, we have flow. So from zero flow to 100%. And these boilers have an efficiency curve that's usually pretty optimal over a wide range and then drops off at low flow and high flow. So you can imagine one large boiler operating at 100%. Yes, it's able to supply the, the steam necessary for all the consumers, but it's going to have pretty low efficiency. What we can rather do is have multiple boilers, so three or four here in this case, running, 
and we can operate them all at their peak efficiency and turn them on and off as needed. So our overall efficiency there is much, much larger. Okay? So we get improved reliability and improved efficiency from this setup. Okay? We don't risk uh, the, the case where one unit shut down the entire process. And then a final example of reliability that, we'll, that you'll see is, is on the utility side of the plant. So we spoke there about steam. But consider, for example, electricity generation in Ontario or any, any large uh, province. Okay? Electricity is not something we can store. Once it's generated, it must be consumed. Okay? Same with steam. We can't store the steam. Oxygen, gases, compressed gases that we require in our process, those are not things that we can easily stockpile and keep for later. They need to be consumed in, at the same time that they're produced. So across the province here for natural gas, we'll have a, a, a natural gas network of pipelines. So we'll have various units providing that natural gas to us from a variety of sources. And that gets put into this pipeline. Off this pipeline, we have various consumers. So this is homes, businesses. And they're consuming this at a variable rate. We cannot control this. As the, as the natural gas producer, you cannot dictate the flow rates down here. So this, you just have to accept this variation up and down. But you have to meet it. So you're providing this to meet that demand. You may need, at times, to purchase additional gas from another outside source. Or you may have gas stockpiled here in liquid form and then vaporize it with a small heat exchange loop there as needed as well in order to supply the necessary demand. You have perhaps on your network some demand that you can control and manipulate. So you can use this valve over here to balance supply and demand to some extent, but not totally. Sometimes your consumers over here, they're going to consume a lot more than you need. And at other times, for example, late at night or on a summit, in the summertime on a hot day, there's going to be negligible consumption <coughs> here. So we have to have a last escape route for this system. So for natural gas, what we'll do is if we're producing more than is being consumed, we have to end up flaring it and disposing it. And we cannot stockpile it too much. Electricity is another example where we just cannot stockpile it. So for example, the Ontario government will often give away electricity to Quebec and New York State for free at negative charge, so just to get rid of it because there's excess supply. So networks are very hard to balance from a supply and demand perspective, but again, this is one, we have to network it up like that to make sure we've got a reliable supply here for our consumers. So networks are often seen when you need high reliability. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up the reliability topic. Uh, many any questions, thoughts on that section of the possible slide before we move on? <coughs> yes, sir. Um, how would we incorporate this into our project? Okay, good question. How would you incorporate this into your project that's due two months from now? So, uh, ensure a lot of the reliability aspect comes from the critical nodes. So, nodes that you cannot afford to have shut down. So, for example, if you're on the methanol synthesis reactor, that reactor, we're not going to always buy a parallel reactor just because of the excessive cost. Okay, so there we won't have that reliability because it's just too, too expensive to get that reliability. But the additional heat exchanger next to the reactor, that's something that will foul and that will get uh, the need to be cleaned out. Okay, so there we will put in a parallel reactor. So again, it's, it's a balance. Your reliability can only be balanced by so much cost. But um, the, so where we usually see reliability on units that are fairly cheap to have duplicate parallel units of, and are units that are going to be critical to us keeping keeping the process running. Okay. So let's move on into the next section, which is the transition <laughs> notes. So these were posted, posted yesterday, and what we're going to start to see here is some of the material that you looked at in yesterday's tutorial. So this uh, will cover a lot of some, uh, many of the questions we looked at yesterday. 
So startups and shutdowns are incredibly common on a process. Um, we're always starting and shutting down some units when they're coming out of maintenance, they need to be turned back on again, or they're turned down when they, they go into maintenance. And it's unfortunate, but a, a known fact, that most accidents and injuries occur during those startups and shutdowns. Because they're occurring far less frequently than regular processes. It's not something that operators are used to doing, so there's usually mistakes made during startups and shutdowns. Um, the reason as well is because when we're starting up and shutting down, we're moving that process to very unusual times of operation. We're adding in new flows that might not normally be there. We'll see an example of that coming up. And you need to, it's just a very different way of operating. And operators, if they're used to operating continuously, are not totally comfortable with the starter procedure and the shutdown procedure. And they don't get a lot of chance to practice. So, so we have to try and make the system as foolproof as possible and provide the necessary equipment to do that smoothly. So let's take a look at an example we considered yesterday in the tutorial. We didn't go through this, so this is a good opportunity to cover that, that question. So here we have a system where we've got an exothermic reactor occurring in the pack bed. So my inlet temperature is low, leaving here is a much greater temperature and from an efficiency perspective, we can use that heat to preheat our feed. <coughs> so this cold feed coming in, if we did not have this heat exchanger, in fact, this reaction would not, not, not occur to any great extent in the reactor. So we need to raise the temperature of our feed to a higher point so that that reaction occurs. This reaction releases a great deal of heat. Let's use that heat in an efficient manner and exchange in the pipe. Over there and let our whole product leave. So that, that solves our efficiency issue. We can get some good efficiency over there. But how do we start this up? So we've got cold feet coming in. This stream over here, running vertically from bottom to top, doesn't exist yet. It's off. So how are we going to heat up that cold feet to the temperature necessary during a startup procedure? Do a switch over once this temperature reaches the right point. Any other suggestions? Great. Yes. And a steam bypass before the reactor. So um, before your reaction occurs, you can start to heat up and then it's not ready in the loop. So as your process is going, it's not going to hit that uh, steam. Okay, so just to say, where's the steam bypass? So like after your heat pump, after your heat changer, yeah. um, this is the bypass into it. No, um, that's kind of hard to explain, but okay. so off of that line, uh, after the heat changer, yeah. and like, yeah, right there, and oh, awesome. no, just off that, so you're not, so you're going to hit the reactor still, Okay. but you saw that line, so that when your reaction is occurring, you don't have to go through here. So you've gone through an additional heat exchanger, or yeah. Okay, so okay, so steam bypass heat exchanger. I yeah. Say. Okay. So add an additional heat exchanger. So Priya suggested using the same heat exchanger, we just change the, the tubing uh, to allow steam to be used as well as the hot air fluent, and then have a switchover. And then Greg is suggesting a, a new piece of equipment <coughs> to bypass on it. Okay. So take a minute to draw to draw that option, because what we're going to do is we're going to add to that all the, remember when we say startup, we have to be very specific. Right? We have to tell our operators exactly which valves to open, which valves to close, what temperatures to monitor. So take a second to add, or a minute or two to draw onto the other diagram, work with the person next to you, to add all the necessary valves and the control loops 
and be very specific in your instructions to the operators. Okay, what to open and what to close. <coughs> Diagram is going to get pretty pretty messy by the end of this. There's a lot of equipment that needs to be added to do this correctly. So to make sure you leave enough space in your drawing. So any comments regarding the use of just a single heat exchanger but using steam during startup and then switching over to that feed? So trying to get away with one heat exchanger rather than two. Any doubts, comments, concerns about that? It sounds great, you want to save capital, but is, might there be any risk with that? Is it easier to have an electric heater it's only temporary instead of having a whole steam line built for temporary use? Okay, so have an electric heater that's temporary? Yeah. Okay, so so still, your suggestion is still to use two heat exchangers rather than one. Uh, but I, so I'm asking if, if we just wanted to use one heat exchanger, might there be any risks with that? Uh, you could contaminate your products or there might be like a side reaction to water. So have, you're going to have water in your product lines. Right. Switch over. Okay, so it's a great suggestion. I like it. It's one, one that's, that commonly comes up is to try to use this heat exchange here, but then feed steam just for a short period during startup. But this steam is going to potentially contaminate the product line. Um, and if steam has a side reaction with that product, that could be dangerous. In the case where those risks don't exist, absolutely that is a valid consideration. Okay. So let's take a look at the alternative suggestion though. So we've got Suggestion of an additional heat exchanger over here. And Arif's suggestion is to use electricity. Greg's suggestion is to use steam. Okay. Either way, we, we can provide heating to this, to that line over there. So let's put some numbers on this to help our discussion. So here the temperature, we've got our inlet temperature, let's call that T1. Here we've got a temperature T2, 
And let's say that for this reaction to actually start happening, we need T2 to be around 225 degrees. Let's say leaving over here, for argument's sake, T3, that's about 400 degrees Celsius. And we're using this 400 degrees Celsius <coughs> to heat up this cold stream. Let's say normally that's 150. Okay, nice numbers that happen to match your project, right? <laughs> okay, so 150 degrees coming in, we're heating that up, and then we've got our cold product leaving. So what are we going to tell our operators? What's the very first thing we tell them? Step one. Remember that you've got to be very specific. You're writing out a very detailed set of instructions to them. There's no ambiguity, no possible way that they can cause a safety hazard on this process. Open your well. Okay, so open F, let's, yeah, V1, let's get the number. So open V1. Okay. Shouldn't we first? No. Okay, so open V1. I was going to say you should get your source of heat running first. Okay, get our source of heat running first. What do we say to the operators to do that? So give them a valve over there, so V2. So open V2 first, okay? Any other suggestions? Uh, right, it might be kind of redundant, but I checked the uh, like your temperature to start lower. Okay, check that this is in fact low enough that you, yeah. so if this is coming in hot already, you don't need it. Okay. Sure. So that's a good, yeah, so good check. So check T1 is less than 150. If it's greater than 150 or if it's 225, we follow a different procedure. So check T1 is less than 225. If it is, then we'll follow this next procedure. Okay, so assuming that the speed is too cold, what do we tell the operators to do? Do they first open V1 and then V2? V2, then V1. Okay, so open V2. Let's just think a little step ahead before we write out the rest of the procedure. Once V2 is open, what is it about V2 that we want to achieve? Like how much should they open it? 100%, zero, uh, 50%? Remember, we have to be specific. Uh, whatever it takes to get 225 coming out of that heater. Okay, so whatever it takes to get to 225. Kevin? Open it 100%. Open it 100%. What if you overheat it? Back to the turn. You'll probably be okay because it speeds up quicker and then you can uh, go down afterwards. Okay, so it might not be too bad if it's. Yeah, so but how would you check what, what, what the temperature is that you two if you don't have any flow coming in? Because if you just turn off the heat, shouldn't the heater still close? Uh, yeah. The heater is on, you can't go. So why not introduce a valve before the heater, before the reactor, sorry? And then just wait for for the stream to, to move heat up to 225 and then open it to the reactor. Oh, so you're just going to heat a small segment of the pipe. Yeah. Okay. But that's there's a very that's a very short, small amount of material. The moment you open that valve, it will flow in. But and then you need to go cold feedback after it. So you're you're thinking batch when it's continuous. I uh, see what you're doing though, yeah. Okay, so increase add a tank to just preheat the whole tank of material, so going to a batch type approach. There's so many many alternatives. So if this is vapor phase, that would be prohibited to build a, a tank to hold a small amount of vapor. If it's liquid, you could do that. Um, but then again, many times Continuous processes, as a rule of thumb, are less energy intensive than batch processes because you just don't have that large capacity of heat. Today. So, I just want to come back to what Kevin was talking about, this valve position, V2. One thing that we can consider here is that if we're telling our operators to open V2 so that we get to 225, essentially you're asking your operator to be a feedback controller. 
right? So you're telling your operator to play with that valve to get to 225. So that's an expensive PID control. Right there. So if you can replace your operator with a control loop that will manipulate this valve to get to 225, that might be an option there that you can start up a little bit more smoothly. Right, so this steam will open or this electric heat will be supplied to the right amount to get to 225. There's, no, there's less chance for the operators to overshoot and undershoot if it's being done automatically. Okay, so there's, there's a suggestion. It certainly doesn't have to be automated, but it could work well in this, in, in this instance. Okay, so now we've got this, this happening over here. So now we can go ahead with our procedure. So <coughs> open or let's say turn on, and now this is a control loop. Let's call this TC2 rather than T2. So turn on TC2. So make sure that that control loop is working. And then open valve V1. So now I've got my cold feed coming in. It's going to get heated up to 225, enter the reactor 400 degrees Celsius, start exchanging heat over here, and then I'm going to send even hotter feed still coming in. There's a concern over here. Sorry. But if you, if you don't open your valve one, what is this C2 measure? What the temperature of something? The temperature of the inlet to the reactor. There's nothing running here. We're opening, so you turn it on. Okay, so immediately you turn that on, it's going to open that valve fully. Okay. Get your 100% steam. You open this valve here, feed is going to come across, get heated up. And then that valve will close or open to get to the right position. So you preset your valve. It, it will solve what Kevin suggested, open your valve to 100%. The moment that it sees flow, the valve will start to close and move to get to 225. So you get a smooth transition ramping up to your Should you have that temperature sensor <coughs> um, just before like your new heater to detect if the temperature is already around 225 then to kind of put a bypass around the heat exchanger? Okay, so um, okay, so to avoid overheating we need a bypass around this heat exchanger. Okay, so we could do that with a temperature sensor or we could just use the sequence of valves. Okay, so Suggesting adding something like that. Okay, so, maybe. so definitely need a bypass. We need a bypass for another good reason. What is the reason for needing the bypass? We need it for maintenance. And also, once this is actually running, we don't want to be going through this heat exchanger and experiencing all that pressure loss of the heat exchanger. So during regular operation, your path is going to be the yellow line. During startup, your path is going to be through that heat exchanger. Okay, so we need valves over here to isolate this heat exchanger, and we need that bypass as well. So we need to also tell our operators, let's uh, close V3. That's an important point. So we don't bypass that reactor, and they need to open, let's call these valve four and L5, open, V4, and V5. Actually, this opening bell 4 and 5 should have been a little earlier on. Right? So this is going to be standard, right? This messy sort of procedure writing. You're going to experience this in your reports and your hazard and operability studies. So it's not a clean, you won't get it right the first time. So open bell 4 and 5 should have been done over there. I'm working through this intentionally this way so you see the, the thought process required to get this done for your projects and for the future. Okay, so we've got valves four and five open, we've closed valves three, and now we've got material flowing through there. Any concern around this heat exchanger during startup? Okay, so we've got material coming in at 400 degrees here. Exchanging heat here, this is actually going to provide heat and this guy is providing heat over here. Heat exchanger one and two are both providing heat. Yeah, okay, 
So there's a concern that that heat exchanger, let's label that H2, is not going to get us the heat required. <coughs> Uh, you need a temperature sensor after H1, so when that temperature gets to 225, then you shut H2 because you know you've reached your steady state and the exchange from H1 can maintain the whole heat. Okay, so we need some way to switch between the two heat exchanges. Is the TC2 doing that? So if this is at 225 or higher, this is going to close this valve off. Okay. Now during startup, we may you may choose to have this heat exchanger being used or not used. There's one reason why you might not want it used during startup. Okay, and that's simply just pressure losses through that heat exchanger. Okay, so you may want to just bypass this heat exchanger and start up with a small valve over here and over here. You have isolation capacity on that heat exchanger simply to avoid running through that heat exchanger and inducing that pressure loss. That's, a, that's some, some concern. We're going to see coming up shortly, there's another really great reason why that bypass is helpful. Uh, what point would you tell your system to like go through these exchangers? Because like what we had it originally, like it, it would detect like when the temperature coming out of H one is high enough, then you can shut off H two. But if you're bypassing it, I don't point until it to start going through, so that you can actually start to tell it it's heating up and all. Right. So when when do we need to start using H one rather than H two? What's going to be our trigger? <laughs> what might be a reasonable trigger then? Alex, when your T three hits whatever value you require for the so 400. So these numbers up here are, are our regular steady state operations. So once we reach this trigger point, we can switch to using H1 and turn down H2 or turn H2 off. Okay, so this you can easily choose to be manual or automatic. Okay, it's, it's again going to depend on the frequency with which you start up and shut down. If you're doing this regularly, you may certainly want to adding that logic on the control system that if T3 is at 400, take this heat exchanger loop out, uh, sorry, close V2 and take turn off this control loop over here and simply switch to your regular heat exchanger. Yes. But if you do it that way, if there's nothing wrong with the heat exchanger and for whatever reason, heating up to 400 might not be enough, you do it some sort of like competing, something like cheating heat transfer, then you're still not going to get 225 coming out of there. That's right. So. Okay. Jen is now bringing up another good point. What if during regular operation, H1 is getting fouled or some upstream conditions are such, maybe a high flow rate coming in here, very high flow, and this heat exchange is not able to get you to 225. Wouldn't it be a great idea just to leave this guy on and running? Kevin? Why we size the exchange in the first place so it can operate with some flexibility. And if something crazy happens where it can't, then that's where you need to go into emergency mode and start doing some abnormal operations. Okay, so Kevin's suggestion is we size H1 so it can provide that heat exchange despite these upstream disturbances. Okay, so we may not, shouldn't need H2. Yeah? Agree, disagree? What does H2 provide for us? Should we choose to use it in addition to H1, in regular operation, what is H2 doing for us? Think back to a few classes ago. <coughs> Having H2 there in our flow sheet, even if this valve is fully closed, but should we choose to open it at times, what's opening that valve doing for us? What's it getting us? What benefit? Some reliability. 
Okay, so a little bit of reliability. But reliability is if this fails, we've got this guy to fall back on. So we get that reliability. So that's our backup. But think back about the operating window. Yeah? So having this heat exchanger running and operating increases our operating window. We've got ability now to not only add this heat here from this stream running vertically, we also now have H2 to give us additional heat should we require it. In the event, for example, where this inlet stream coming here at 150, what if it dropped down to 120 degrees Celsius? So lower temperatures. And let's say also, because when, when things go wrong, they always go wrong spectacularly. So this is dropping in temperature, but also this flow rate has gone up. So now you've got a lot of material flowing at a cold temperature. This heat exchanger H1 is not going to be able to get that heating that you require. <coughs> now you've got this in ability here from H2. You can turn on this heat exchanger on demand to provide that heating. Okay, so there's definitely a, a positive argument here for increased capital cost, H2, for startup. But to since you spent this money, you might as well leave this guy here ready so that at a moment's notice you can turn it on in the, in the, in the condition that uh, you're not able to meet your 225 inlet. Okay. So if this flow is too, too high and this inlet temperature is too low, you're not going to be able to meet this target over here and then you can turn on H2. Does everyone see, see that? Okay. This, is, this is really important and it actually is a great example of in this operability topic, how making one change to get startup working also improves your reliability and also increases your operating window. We see this all the time. Changes we make to our flow sheet not only buy us increased reliability, they also get us increased operating window and they enhance our ability to control the process. Okay. Um, I can see why you would need like Exchanger <coughs> in case you want to replace the heat exchanger. Yeah. But if you wanted to leave that as like an emergency like backup like, to increase the heat, wouldn't it make more sense to never actually bypass H2 and just accept the pressure drop and just close off V2 so that way when you are reading TC2 always below 125, then you can quickly open a valve and start adding heat instead of having to change V3, open V4, 5, and then open V2? Right, you all opening at once. Yeah, so these valve changes are something that can happen very quickly, especially if you've automated it. Right. So if it's manual, I'd, I'd agree with you, it's a little yeah. bit more tedious, right? And you require someone to actually go there, pay attention to it. But in an automated, automated way, that can be a few seconds at its and you're at temperature again. Okay. So these are all the sorts of concerns that come up through a hazard and operability study that you're all raising, which is great. Yes, Jeff. So you're always thinking in four, feet forward, okay. right? Yeah, I, you're always raising questions okay. related to feet forward, and that's a great, great suggestion. So, Jenna's suggestion is to add uh, where we at now, T4, right? So, measure that temperature over there and feed forward the signal to, to achieve something. Let's think about that one. In this particular case, you've got material flowing through fairly short pieces of piping. The advantage of feed forward is probably not so great. Right. So feed forward, you'll typically use, think of uh, you're driving down your car along the highway and you see a deer in the road a kilometer ahead, you slow down. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's feed forward action. Um, and it works really well when you've got a long time to compensate for this potential problem coming up. But if your time is really limited, and you, then you simply accept the deviation temporarily and then compensate in the feedback mode. Okay. okay. So lots of process control coming through here, <laughs> 3P. <laughs> Anything else about um, this flow sheet that we should consider from regular <coughs> operation? So Priya, before we move on. Well, I guess I mentioned it earlier, that we have product Assuming that we begin 225, like that our double heat exchangers will always be in that temperature. Yeah, we're assuming now that this one, H1 plus H2, are able to get us to 225. Right. Yeah, at startup, yeah, for okay. sure. 
Yeah, and then we'll get 400 coming through. Okay. So now we let's let's assume we've successfully started up the process, and we've got 400 degrees Celsius here, 225. I'd like you to think about this problem now. As is, what's going to happen if this coming in is 225 degrees Celsius. So something happens upstream. Remember, we don't have control over that. What happens if that inlet temperature now is raised? That's why we need to bypass also from your necrotic stream around your junction here. So if you're going over your inlet temperature, you can just bypass some of the flow around. Okay. So Jeff is suggesting a bypass. So what? Okay, what if it's more than 225? That's a good, good question. That's a problem. But that's a problem we won't be able to, to do. But right now, as it stands, what change do we need to make? If this is already at 225 or even slightly higher, what change do we need to make to this flow sheet? What, what would you do as an operator, Alex? We already have a bypass going around the feed to get a change there, so I would make a change for this whole thing. So just make sure that this... Like, it's like for just set up a controller on that so you can adjust the flow of the bypass. Okay, set up a controller on that. Well, let's let's take take that sentence. What do we mean by let's put a controller on that bypass? What, where would, what would we manipulate and what would we measure? Uh, you're already measuring T1. Okay. So you take that as a controller to close the valve through into H1 and use the bypass. Okay, so a suggestion here to measure T1. Let's think what our target is. What do we what do we want to achieve with this this with this run? With 32.5, you just want to maintain that. Okay. So so this controller is going to be running all the time. So regularly this is going to be 150. So what should this controller do that you suggest? to open and close this valve. Right, and then close the one that would go through the Okay, so suggestion here is to add a valve, a control loop to that. So we open and close this valve to get this temperature equal to so I, I, I you got the right idea, just the wrong location of temperature. Because if, from a, let's think from a cause and, cause and effect point of view, opening this valve won't change this temperature. We are accepting this temperature. What you're suggesting would be good from a feed forward perspective. Right? So if, if we measure it here, we could adjust ahead of time. So let's revise that perhaps and say we want to control this bypass based on this temperature over there. So if we want to achieve this temperature, we can reuse this temperature uh, <coughs> sensor over there, but I'm just going to add a new one rather. So TC, we're now at 5. So TC5, take a, take a minute to think about what this control loop is doing. Does that control loop make any sense? We're manipulating this bypass valve to control this temperature here. Brief. Now you got two control systems working on the same temperature, so you get some problems there. And what, why is TC5 here from the TC2? Okay, so TC2 is looping down here to control the, the steam. Yeah. Then? I was wondering if you're controlling <coughs> from that part down, does it have the opportunity then to be heated even further as it's going through those extremes? by the time it gets to that point. Okay, good question. Okay, so let's take, let's uh, answer the question on the two control loops, okay? So we're heading into maybe what's unfamiliar territory for you from a process control point of view, but it's called split range control. Okay, so you've got two sensors and, uh, sorry, one temperature sensor, T, that you're interested in controlling with two valves. So you can either manipulate the steam flow over here, or you can manipulate the valve position. So this bypass can be changed. If we open this valve, we're bypassing the heat exchanger, we provide less heat so I can cool this thing down. 
or I can open this valve over here and provide more heat to that heat exchanger to heat up. So that's a split range controller. There's, we won't go into that topic in this, in, in this course, and in fact in the undergraduate, I don't think you guys covered it in, in the fourth year digital control course. Um, but it is, it is a, a good solution to controlling this particular problem, this is split range control. Priya? <coughs> Okay, so Priya is asking, shouldn't this temperature here always be 225? And how does this control loop actually address that? Does that control loop make any sense at that draw? Well, it'll be 225 if the inlet is lower than 225. Because it, it, the first control loop allows you to heat it up, but if it's hotter than 225 or if it's at 225, you need to set your control to kind of cool it down to keep it that temperature. Okay, so let's bear in mind that 225 coming in here, if it's at 225, the last thing you want to do to the stream is provide any heat transfer to it. Okay, so that's our upper limit. So coming in at 225, you don't want any heat exchange occurring on that stream. So this valve needs to be fully shut and this valve fully open so that you're sending that stream around the heat exchange. So it's still at 225. Again, here yeah, you want absolutely no heat from H2. This valve V4 fully shut and this valve fully open. So you bypass the heat exchange, you're coming in at 225. Everyone see that? So 225 is your upper, le upper limit on the operating <coughs> window on this process. So will you accept that if you have a 225 coming in, you won't know until a certain amount of time. You know, it's going to heat up anyways. It's going to go past the 225. Right. So will you be able to, are you willing to accept that temperature increase? Okay, so now we're down to what's fluid velocity in a pipe, typically. For liquid phase. Rule of thumb from the tutorial, liquid phase fluid flow in a pipe, one meter per second. Vapor phase, 30 meters per second. So this length of piping, it's going to be a certain amount of time, but probably no more than five to 10 seconds that you're going to have that deviation before you react to it, which likely won't be too big of a deal on this reactor. Okay. So again, you see how this is trying to bring in all your knowledge on, on other parts of this undergraduate courses. We have to design our control systems totally aware of what units we're dealing with. So that temporary disturbance of a few seconds, we can deal with it. We can then open these bypasses, and, and it's not going to be too much of a problem, for sure. There's one other thing I want to point out about this control loop as is. As, it, as it's drawn here, this works really well. Okay? If this temperature here is too high or too low, we'll open and close this bypass. And essentially what that does is, very quickly, bypasses the heat exchanger and gets you back on target. So we recall from, from our tutorial yesterday, we want fast dynamics, really rapid response. In a, very, in a few seconds, you open this valve, you'll quickly achieve your temperature back to control. So if this temperature is too high, you'll open the valve here to bypass it. This temperature is too low, you'll close this valve, sending more material through the heat exchanger. So very quick dynamics are achievable. But you wouldn't always like on, off and on, right? Like you would throttle partially, so you'd send like a little bit through the heat exchanger, a little around. Right. So it's not at 225. Absolutely. It's not, it's not an on-off. It's, it's a smooth opening and closing valve. It's not bang-bang control. Yeah. So from a controllability perspective, this bypass works really, really well. And it gets you that, that uh, very fast dynamics. Yes. Okay, well the heat exchangers, the heat exchangers are doing their job, but what we have to recognize is that coming in here is not constant. Okay? There's varying flows, varying temperatures. And coming back around us, depending on the impurities in the stream, we may or may not always be at 400. 
So we do need this, this control loop to keep us stable. So we've run out of time, unfortunately, for today's class. I'm kind of, I'm, we didn't cover anything that I planned to cover. <laughs> and I'm glad we actually had this discussion because it's really starting to make you think about how we set up our flow sheets eventually. So there's a lot more to it than just linking up units. Okay? So we'll continue on with the notes in the next class.